My name's Tim Roberts and I'm sitting here in front of you in sunny Newcastle. The sun's gone down and we've all been locked down. So we're looking forward to this um, fantastic seminar. Kiara Harrison is my co-host and she's helping us go uh, right through the night. Todd Elliott is our first speaker, Marie Elliott our second speaker, Heidi Pritchard our third, and then we'll have questions. You'll see on the bottom of your screen, you 64 people who are already here. You'll see that uh, uh, we have a Q&A section there. If you want to ask us a question, then please type in your question in the Q&A and we will go from there. So, Kiara, could I have the first slide, please? Right, please. Right. As you can see on this slide, uh, we have received funding from uh, the federal government, Inspiring Australia, through Inspiring Australia, New South Wales. And that funding has come to the Hunter Innovation and Science Hub. The Science Hub is aimed at bringing science awareness to the Hunter region. And what we're doing uh, this year in My Science Odyssey is bringing five groups of scientists to you to reveal their personal journeys to a life of science and interest in science. So tonight we've got Fungi Fanatics and then Next Saturday night, we've got uh, Stepping Into Science, where Kiara will be one of the speakers, plus others who are getting into the research business of science, still at university. Then definitely on the 4th of November, successful authors, Sammy Bailey, Jonica Newby and Patrice Newell will be presenting uh, and that the title of that is Putting It on Paper, that seminar. Two other seminars to come, and because of COVID and lockdowns and so on, I haven't yet decided the date that they'll be on. But one is bee buzziness, where we'll be looking at bees and the science of bees. And the other one is to look a little into the future with uh, Gary Ellum and also conservation biologist, Prof Matt Haywood. We're going to record all these seminars and put them up on the HISH website and YouTube. So please have the next slide, Kiara. And nothing can go wrong in all of this. Um, as I said, we've got Todd somewhere out from Armadale. We've got Marie somewhere out from Scone and Heidi is somewhere in Newcastle and I'm also somewhere in Newcastle and Kiara is somewhere near Maitland, I believe. So we're all around the place. We hope everything works and uh, we're going to be here until 8.30. So let me go to the next slide, please, Kiara, because I want to introduce to you all our first speaker, Todd Elliott is a naturalist, a photographer, he's a biologist from the United States. He studied in North Carolina for his undergraduate degree. And then we're lucky enough to have him in Australia doing PhD research in Armadale. And he's looking at fungi, of course, because that's what he's done ever since he could walk, I think. And uh, he's looking at the spreading of fungal spores by the vertebrates that eat the fungi. He's undertaken research projects on six different continents and he's been involved in the naming of more than a hundred different fungi species and five different genera as well. Busy enough, you would think, but as well, he's been an author of a field guide for mushrooms of the Southeast. In, uh, in the United States. So with that, I'd like to welcome Todd. What we've done with Todd's presentation is it is a video and Kiara will now start off that video. Thank you.
Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ty Elliott and um, I'm thrilled to be here speaking about my sort of experience with fungi and um, I'd like to, I'm titling this talk Fantastic Fungi because I think they're a fantastic group of organisms and I'd like to share with you some of the reasons I think they're so interesting and some of my journey through why I became interested in mycology specifically. Well, for those of you that haven't spent a lot of time looking at fungi, they're an incredibly diverse and interesting and beautiful group of organisms. Um, and for me, my sort of fascination with them started out as a child growing, growing up in the bush. I'm originally from the U.S., um, from the Southern Appalachian Mountains. And growing up where I was from, I started finding all these interesting mushrooms in the forest. And next thing I knew, I was trying to figure out what they were. And one thing led to another, and I just became fascinated in all their diversity, their life forms, and their interactions. Um, and particularly what I find interesting is interactions in the natural world. And one of the groups of fungi that I particularly became fascinated with at first was the insect pathogens. And insect pathogens are a specialized group of mushrooms that attack insects and kill them. And they have all sorts of interesting applications, both as insecticides, um, but also some of them are really important medicine. So like the photo I showed down there in the lower left of this slide, um, that's a fungus that from, it was derived uh, cyclosporin, which is one of the, uh, an immunosuppressant that helps make organ transplants possible. And I'll see if I can move this one so you can see it fully. Um, and so these, these mushrooms are incredibly specialized. Some of them alter the behavior of insects, make them crawl to higher points to be able to disperse their spores. But I just became fascinated with this idea that there were some fungi that were so tied in with small parts of the ecosystem, but also there's some that are found everywhere. Um, and this sort of fascination, and I also was particularly interested in finding edible mushrooms as a, particularly growing up in, the, in rural North America, um, I go out in the forest and harvest lots of different edibles and learning to identify edibles helped me improve my taxonomic abilities and those sorts of things. Um, well, when I was a teenager, I stumbled across a truffle and a truffle are sort of an underground mushroom. And this truffle um, led me to meet one of my long-term mentors, a fellow by the name of James Trappy. And some of you who have um, been around Australian mycology may have come across him. Jim has been working with mushrooms for all since the 1950s and um, it's led him to work on fungi all over the world and he's particularly interested in truffles. And through him I was introduced into this whole underground world, shall we say both literally and figuratively, um, of these mushrooms that grow deep in the soil. And these mushrooms produce little round fruiting bodies and they grow underneath a leaf litter, sometimes down into the mineral soil and they release pungent aromas that attract animals. The animals come dig them up and carry the spores to the forest. Now these mushrooms are also particularly important for the trees because they tie into the tree's roots. 80 to 90 percent of the plants on the planet depend on mushrooms to help with their nutrient uptake. So a root grows out into the forest and the fungal mycelium, which is the underground parts of a mushroom, grow around that tree's roots and increase its ability to absorb nutrients by hundreds if not thousands of times. Under your footprint, there can be hundreds of kilometers of these cell-wide strands spreading out through the soil. Well, all of those fruiting bodies that you see through the forest, they, underneath the ground or in the wood or in the insect, in the case of those insect pathogens, they um, are actually growing from these little tiny threads. And those threads are spread out through the forest absorbing nutrients. Well, here's an example of some truffles. And truffles are found all over the world. And Jim was very kind to me as a teenager and took me around to different places on different ones of his projects. I got to come to Australia a few times. I got to work in Turkey with him. I got to work in Mexico and Canada, all over different parts of the US. Um, and he was an incredible mentor and took incredible amounts of time to sort of show me the basics of learning how to identify the, these mushrooms, but also to begin to understand the ecology. And through this, I was able to get introduced into all different aspects of fungal ecology. And I also met a lot of other people through Jim's connections that helped introduce me to be able to work in other places. I got to spend time in, in the Congo Basin in West Africa, in, um, in, the southern, in the Northern Amazon, different places working on different aspects of fungi. And one of the common threads was looking at these truffles and how they tie in with 
the ecosystems. There's also a lot of interest in truffles from the perspective of cultivation because they're one of the most valuable legal commodities in the world. And as food value, they can sell for over $1,000 a kilo if they're good quality truffles. But the ones that I was particularly interested in were a lot of these species that you see here on this slide, and they're very, very ecologically important, but most of them are not of much food value, to humans that is. Well, part of why I became so interested in these truffles was they, their attachment in, with, with trees, but also I was fascinated to learn about how they interact with other animals. So for example, the, the, these truffles, small fruiting bodies, but these pungent aromas that they release attract lots of different animals to dig them up. Well, in Australia, there's an incredible diversity of these animals that are both mammals, they're birds, they're insects, they're reptiles that are eating these fungi. And when they eat them, they will actually disperse the spores. And a lot of the spores can pass viably through their digestive tract. Now, for a lot of mushrooms, if they fruit above the soil, they're releasing the spores into the air, which is an important way for spore dispersal. But when you're above the ground, you're exposed to be able to be eaten and found by animals before you're ripe. So they'll actually see them, eat them, and then the spores might not be mature, so they may not get dispersed. So it's really important that they were releasing these aromas that can be detected once they're actually mature. But there's also some animals like birds that are visually cute and they have less strong olfactory abilities that the mammals do, and they actually have to find them visually. So this is a study that I worked on looking at superb lyrebirds. Now, lyrebirds are incredible, incredible birds, and they turn over hundreds of kilos, or hundreds of tons actually, of soil every season. And that turnover of soil actually helps aerate the, the soil, also helps to break down nutrients. So I was particularly interested to understand if they were also dispersing fungal spores. And so I started spending time following lyrebirds around. And um, here's, a, here's a lyrebird that's scratching. And if you look in the digs, there's a few truffles left behind. But also, when I started to take lyrebird scats and put them under the microscope, you can see underneath here, those are all different spores of truffles. And I found there were sometimes as many as 14 different species of truffles being dispersed through lyrebird scats. So I realized that they're actually important dispersers as well as soil turnover. So why would this soil turnover be so important? Well, this is particularly important in Australia because there's an incredible diversity of eucalyptus. And eucalyptus trees have a lot of oils in their leaves. So when the leaves fall to the soil, they release oils onto the soil surface. And that creates an oily layer. And that oily layer can create a hydrophobic area in the soil that the water can't actually penetrate. So when an animal comes along and digs for a truffle, or other subterranean foods, they're actually turning over the soil and they're allowing for air, but they're also allowing for water to penetrate. And when the water can get in, it can actually help the soil get nourished with both the moisture, but also it helps all the mushrooms that are tied into the tree's roots be able to actually get nutrients out of the soil to then pass. And so when a lot of these animals have started to be decline, particularly with the mammals, and when they're no longer digging, then the soil's not getting aerated as much. Fires get hotter, water can't penetrate. The soil, when the fires come through, they burn off a lot of the organic matter because it's drier. It's not getting mixed in with the soil, not, getting, not retaining moisture as well. And that means the fires burn hotter, they cook the soil and it hurts the mycorrhizae, which are what's the underground parts of the mushrooms tied in with the roots. And the whole system can be to disintegrate. And that may be part of the reason we've seen such intense fires these last few years in Australia. Now, here's, a, here's an illustration showing some of these aspects of these animals digging fungi. So the example I gave on the previous slide was a lyrebird, but there's also many, many other species of animals around the world that use fungi for food. Everything from polar bears down to little tiny shrews and squirrels and antichinus and all sorts of things like that. So here's a diagram showing, well, a swamp wallaby is digging under a eucalyptus tree. They're digging up a truffle group called Mesophelias and the spores that are in their scats. There's also an illustration here of a North American red squirrel. And red squirrels, they eat lots and lots of fungi, and they also store a lot of them. They this behavior called caching. And they'll hide the food in the trees and then eat them all through the winter. And then a lot of other animals come and steal from their caches. So there's an example of a bird's nest filled with truffles. 
um, that the squirrel has hidden up there. So part of the research that I'm currently working on is trying to understand the actual ecological implications of this and what these animal dispersal actually looks like. So this is a paper we recently worked on looking at swamp wallabies. Now swamp wallabies are one of the larger native animals that can actually disperse fungal spores. Um, and swamp wallabies, these are digs after a fire in Victoria where they've actually come through and dug up Mesophelia truffles. There's a picture of Mesophelia in the upper corner of this slide. And we found by looking at the scats and also looking at how far swamp wallabies move and also how fast the spores pass through their digestive system that they're actually able to disperse spores hundreds, maybe even a thousand meters from where they were eaten. And that's insignificant for the truffles because remember, they're underground and they can't get their spores released into the air like normal above ground mushrooms. But when you're underground, you're also better adapted to dry and hot environments and freezing and thawing. And so it actually protects the fruiting bodies, but you then rely on an animal disperser. So this is one area that we're looking at, but then I was particularly interested to see, well, what about secondary dispersal? So is a dingo or is a qual or a Tasmanian um, devil or tigers or lions or whatever, are they eating animals that then eat truffles? And then as secondary carnivores, are they actually, as the carnivores, they're secondarily dispersing spores. So I wanted to look at this among dingoes in Australia. So what we did was we went out and collected dingo scats all along transects. And then we also did a lot of trapping to look at what the, primary, the prey animals were eating. And we found that about one in four of the dingo scats actually had fungal spores in them. And many different genera, in, this, in our study we found 14 different genera of fungal spores were being dispersed by dingoes. But what's interesting is you remember the swamp wallabies, their maximum dispersal distance was a bit over a kilometer, whereas we found that um, dingoes could potentially disperse spores up to 10 kilometers from where they had eaten the prey animal. So realize that dingoes are operating significantly on a, on a much, more, much larger scale, excuse me, and they're dispersing these spores all through the landscape, and particularly in a fragmented landscape where, say, a bush rat or some small mammal might not be able to carry the spores between fragments. A dingo will run and carry the spores and deposit them in scats, and that in turn helps the trees, helps the plant community, helps the soils, and also then helps small mammals be able to get food that they need. So it's all part of how we can see these whole, whole ecosystems are connected. Now, I'd like to wrap up by talking briefly about fungal rots. Now, the fungi I just talked about were these decomposers, and I think or were about the mycorrhizal ones, but the decomposers are really important as well. They're breaking down all that organic matter, and they're helping to create rich, composty, loamy soils. So you'll see, sometimes you see a stump like this that has those dark lines in it. Those are actually mushrooms growing through the wood. Or sometimes you see brown logs that are sort of all broken into little cubicle sections. Those are also types of fun, fungal decomposers or fungal rots. But in Australia, this is particularly important because there's not cavity excavating birds like woodpeckers. And so a lot of these cavities are actually created by mushrooms that decompose them. So when you think about those possums or the gliders or the parrots or the numerous different types of animals that are nesting or living in rotten hollows and trees, there's fungi that are responsible for that. In this case, these are white punk fungus or latoporus. And this latoporus is, gets into the heartwood of old eucalyptus trees and rots it out. And then that allows for a cavity to develop. And then you can see these rainbow lorikeets poking out of a cavity in the end of a decomposed log. And in other parts of the world, it's beginning to become clear that woodpeckers are actually dispersing these and that there's also insects involved in these associations. And it's a really complex and amazing interaction. But in Australia, we're still only barely beginning to understand this. So I recommend that when you're out in the woods, and part of what got me so exciting was just understanding all these different interactions that are occurring all around us. But pay attention when you see a cavity in a tree. Don't just think about the animal that's living in there, but also think about the fungus that helped create it. And also the fungi that are tied in with the roots that are keeping that tree alive. So anyways, well, I want to thank you so much for your time. And I hope you give that gives you a little glance into some of the fascinating interactions that I'm interested in in the fungal world and also some of the research I've been working on. Um, and yeah, I'd love to see if there's any questions. Um, I have some contact info and my socials in this, um, this slide. So thank you. Well, Todd, thank you very, very much for that. That was fantastic. And you will come, uh, you will come live later on when we're 
have the questions, uh, question and answers. Just want to reflect a little bit in there. I was delighted to see my old friend Jim Trappy there. And it was interesting that Todd referred to Jim as his mentor. Let's go back into Greek history a little bit. Odysseus, he went on an odyssey all around the world, right? He went on an odyssey, not a science odyssey, but an odyssey. And he had a son, Telemachus, who needed to be looked after. So he called up his friend Mentor and said, Mentor, will you look after my son, Telemachus? And that's it. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? But it's really interesting from the point of view of for all of us and all of you out there. And I hope uh, there's at least 107 of you out there looking now. Now's the time, if you haven't already, to find your mentor, to find somebody who's in a position that you would like to be, who will help you get into that position. In this case, Todd Elliott found Jim Trappy. So I now want to go to Scone. And in Scone, we have Marie Elliott. Marie is no relation to Todd. It's just amazing that two of my speakers have exactly the same surname, but Marie has done natural history illustration at the University of Newcastle. She's a field mycologist and uh, she looks after the fungi collection at the Hunter Region Botanic Gardens. During her time, she's uh, uh, on her trip, she's uncovered a rare and endangered underground orchid that turned out to be a new species. And her illustrations, her fungi illustrations and photographs appear in international and national journals. So let's all welcome Marie Elliott. Marie, would you please take the stage? And that's happening. It is happening. Marie is coming on. And, it's happening. Uh, yes, we've got a round okay. of applause. Marie, thank you. My name is Marie Elliott and I am, became interested in fungi because of the unusual shapes and colours. My talk will not be about fungi, but how I actually got into fungi. And if you are interested in science, my um, uh, suggestion is that you follow your passion, look for opportunities and you take a risk. I, I first discovered fungi as a child when, when I would go out with my father foraging for field mushrooms. Um, and I was always interested in plants. We were bush kids. We spent a lot of time in the bush. And um, I, was, I really wanted to do botany when I left school, but I went to school in a small country town that only went to year 10 and I needed to go to another town to do year 11 and 12. And being the oldest of 10 kids, that was not going to happen. So my mother suggested I go nursing, which I did. And um, I was too young to start any training, but eventually I, I uh, graduated as a registered nurse and a midwife. And I got married and came to a local hospital. And I also came across fungi. Fungi that cause disease mainly like tinea and also dispensed uh, medication that was derived from fungi. In my mid thirties, I decided to leave nursing. I found physically and mentally I was not in a very good place. So I left nursing and um, started to enjoy life a bit more and um, went to the local school where my children went and decided I would work in the volunteer in their canteen. Absolutely hopeless in the canteen. So I went over to the library and the library was a much calmer place. It was uh, not so noisy. There was books everywhere and I just loved books and reading. And after a while, I got a job in that library and um, that job, at that job, they suggested that I do the library technicians course at TAFE. So I, I, I um, did that. And one day I went out to the local TAFE library to get some information about 
um, and Hassan and I was doing, and the librarian there said, what are you doing that for? And I thought that was a strange question to ask. She said, you should be doing the degree. And um, that, that's the least of your worries. And she gave me all the information, wrote it down, and I put it in my bag, took it home, and I thought, I really can't do this. And I thought, oh, I just can't do it. And I thought, but next time I go out there, she's going to say to me, have I applied to do that degree? So I thought, I'll just um, fill it all out and send it off, and that'll be the end of it. And a couple of months later, I got a letter from Charles Sturt Uni saying that I had been accepted. And that's where things really got complicated. Not from a family point of view, they were very supportive, but I thought, how am I going to do this? So the little parcel came, I was doing it online, part-time, working, children, and the parcel came and I read it and in there it said, student services, um, if you needed help with assignments and essay writing, contact us. So I contacted the um, student services and I would send them drafts of my assignments. And I just concentrated on one assignment and the results came back and I got a distinction and a pass. So then I realised that I needed to do this amount of work so I don't fail. But if I really wanted to do well, then I needed to put this amount of work into it. And it was a fascinating degree because I learned about databases, how um, search engines work, how to build a website using HTML language, how to organise um, information, how to organise objects. And um, it also had a major that I could do, and it was art history I chose. And art history was interesting because it made me critique and analyse and think laterally, which um, was a great advantage later on. At the end of that degree, we were offered a Master of Teaching and it's probably the only opportunity that I was given in my life that I turned down. And I am uh, glad I did not take up teaching because the next stage of my life was much more interesting. Um, after that degree, I was looking around for a fine arts degree and I found this degree called Natural History Illustration. And at the end of the first months in that uh, the first year in that degree. Excuse me, Marie, lecture. can I interrupt yes. a sec? And are you sharing your screen? I hope so. Okay. You can't you've... see it? Righto, you've got to um, select it now. So go to the share screen arrow the, down the bottom, click on that. Now click on your slides and then click on the share screen. We winning? Sorry to interrupt, I but I just noticed you. Were, no, you look to be clicking. I dropped with your out. Finger. I dropped out. Okay. So, just I take. I have to a, get back in again. Take a minute to do the share screen. We can still see you. Okay. Okay. Go to the down the bottom share screen. Click on that. I can't even get Zoom up at the moment. Oh, here we uh, go. For some reason, we're still seeing you. It's asking me to enter my email. Oh. I might have to start from scratch. I think I might have dropped out. No, you're not dropped out because we can okay. still see you. So did you see my screen at all? We see your picture, your what your camera is showing, but now we've got you've got to share your screen. Okay. You might have opened Zoom again, I think. But um, what happens when you click on share screen down the bottom? Can you see? I can't find. Share screen. Move your mouse down to the bottom of, um, you, you mightn't be in your Zoom picture. Uh, right. 
Any joy yet? No, sorry. You might have to go on to the next one till I sort it out. Okay. Okay, where are we, um, Kiara? Heidi, I think we will move to you and then and then uh, see how we go coming back to Marie. All right, so. Uh, okay, okay, this is uh, one of the joys of COVID, of course, for all of us and the whole state of New South Wales is now in lockdown. But for those of us, the 108 of us who are sitting in front of our screens, we've got uh, another wonderful person coming on to speak to us. Heidi Pritchard has uh, just uh, graduated from the University of Newcastle. She tells me she's an environmental scientist in disguise as a high school teacher, um, a musician, a photographer, a creative person in every, every sense with a keen interest in fungi. She's worked with world-renowned uh, mycologists and scientists. Uh, she's traveled to Borneo with me, which was fantastic. And she's currently on a mission to educate the youth of Australia about sustainability, climate change, and the environment. So over to Heidi, thank you. Hi everyone. Well, I'm just trying to get this screen sharing happening. There we go. My mum's telling me to smile in the background. And now the slideshow. And, and... <laughs> all right, I hope you can all see that. Yes. Yep, great. So I just, Tim asked me to, to join this panel and to do a talk. And then he just kind of said like, oh, why don't you just talk about your journey? And I hadn't really been asked to talk about that before. So I didn't really know what to say or how to start it. So I decided to start by telling you how it began with this blue mushroom that you see and I was, I was in maybe year six or year seven at school and I went to a Steiner school and our our typical school excursions were out in the bush um, with a compass and a map and making our own tracks and exploring and finding all sorts of amazing places and we were on one of those those uh, trips in in the Wadigan mountains and I came across this little blue mushroom. It was just sitting in the moss. Um, it looked so stunning and just like stood out. There was nothing else around it. It was just this blue mushroom. And I thought, oh, that's really amazing. Like I've never seen that before. Like, what is this? And no one else really seemed interested. They didn't really care. Like they're like, oh yeah, blue mushroom, whatever, and just kept going. But uh, I could have just looked at it for hours. It was amazing. And then a few weeks later, uh, I was in a, a family holiday down in the Blue Mountains. We're at the Botanic Gardens there and I was looking in the bookshop and there was a book on fungi of Australia. And I sat there in that bookshop on the floor and flicked through every page of that book looking for this blue mushroom. And it wasn't in there. And that was a real shock. I thought, surely, like, this is a, a book on fungi of Australia. Like, why isn't this blue mushroom in there? So my parents bought the book in order to get me out of the bookshop, otherwise we probably would still be there. And then I made it my mission to find every single mushroom that was in that book. I haven't done that yet, but I've definitely got quite a way towards that goal. And my other mission was to find out what on earth that blue mushroom is. So I went back to find it again, and I did. I found it lots of times. I've been back nearly every year and I have found out what it is, sort of. I still don't know what name to call it because there's a lot of argument about whether we should call it Entoloma hoxtederi, Entoloma varescens, Inosophilus varescens. It's a whole bunch of different names people think it should be. Um, so it's quite, I find it quite funny that I still don't know what to call it. But I've now like this started this drive to find all these mushrooms. They're just fascinating and so many different colors and shapes and pretty much everywhere you look, you can find something. So that's what I did. I started looking around and 
This is while I was still in high school, still at school. I started looking, started getting into photography and taking pictures of them as well. And I found that kind of helped me to be able to work out what they are. And I also discovered the more that I found, the more that I didn't know what they were and no one could tell me what they were. And everywhere I looked in books on the internet, and I, it was so hard to work out what to call these different fungi. Some of them I could find names really easy. And then other ones were just like, no idea. No one had ever seen it before. Oh no, I don't know what that one's called. So I started going out on forays. Um, I met a few other people also interested in fungi, some mycologists as well. Pam O'Sullivan is um, one of the, the main people who kind of guided me through my early days into fungi. And she's really incredible. She's my mentor, I suppose. And she could probably put names to maybe three quarters of the stuff that I found. So that was a really good start. And I started to be able to learn to ID them as well and found some new, new spots to go and look. And that kind of led me into uni. So at the end of school, I didn't really know what to do. So I just decided, well, uni probably isn't a bad idea. So I did an environmental, uh, environmental science degree and I was pretty annoyed that they didn't offer any courses in mycology or anything about mushrooms. The closest they got was one lecture in the Australian flora course, um, which wasn't really enough for me. So then I decided to to do an honours project after I finished my degree. And that was a year of looking particularly at um, bolletes, these ones that you can see. And these are, bolletes are mushrooms that have sponge underneath instead of gills, they've got pores. And there's quite a few really interesting ones in Australia that haven't really been studied before. And we found a couple of these in some fungi forays in the Wadigans with Roy Halling from New York. He came over to Australia, we did some um, forays looking for new things, exciting things, and we found some. And he kind of pushed me to do an honours project and he offered to be my supervisor. So that's what I did and we found that there were these two different, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but the two different um, types of mushrooms we've got on the screen here are two different species of Chasoporus that were undescribed and it was the first record of this genus to be native to Australia. Previously, they thought it was only introduced. So that made a really good honours project for me. I uh, really enjoyed it and learned a lot. Also, you got to see a qual. I just had to put that in. That was a highlight of field work, I reckon. Looking up in the water against some mushrooms and that day, we didn't really find any good ones, but we did see a qual, so made up for it. Just had to put that in as perks to to being out in the field, that's for sure. And then once I finished my honours, I was still kind of kept in touch with the mycology community, went around and did four A's, met up with Todd and Jim Trappy, did some truffle workshops, um, which were really great, led some walks, um, just like kept in touch, kept doing things to do with mycology. And Tim as well has been really involved in that, organising events like this one and all sorts of things as well, which is really great. But then I kind of, after uni, didn't really want to keep doing uni. Like I had the option to do a PhD, but I just didn't feel like studying anymore. So I decided to work for a year as a teacher's aide. And before the end of that year, I was already enrolled in a master's of teaching. So I guess I'm not good at not studying, but I've nearly finished that. I've been working all this year as a high school teacher and what I really want to do is teach people about fungi, I suppose. So this slide here is kind of showing where the study of fungi can take you. These are some of the nicest people I've met with all really keen interest in the natural world and fungi, everything. Um, you'll see Todd in some of these pictures and Marie in some of these pictures as well. My two mentors, Pam and Roy, are in the tree with me. They're definitely bad influences for sure. Um, so I, I probably could have taken this down the science route, down the research route, but instead I think I'm going to go education. And while I'm a high school teacher at the moment, I'm definitely trying to encourage students to be interested, 
not just in fungi, just in the natural world, because there's quite a bit of disconnect, I think, and it's important to be in touch. And if you get in touch with nature through fungi, then great, you know, can't complain with that. So any of you who are listening and watching on, if you'd like to know how to find out more about fungi, um, I've just put up a slide here with definitely not an exhaustive list, just three of the main books that I started with. Now, the first book on the left, A Field Guide to Australian Fungi, that's the one that I found in the bookshop in the Blue Mountains and it didn't have the blue one in it. But it definitely kick-started an interest because I flicked through those pages and I just wanted to see these mushrooms. Now, the book in the middle is by Pam Sullivan and Sky Moore, um, two very inspirational people. And that's a book on fungi of the, the Hunter region. And that's a really, really good field guide. It's also available as a PDF as well. And then the third one is Tasmanian fungi. And I put that in there because even though it's for Tasmania, quite a lot of it is relevant to my area and it's got really good descriptions and identification features. So if you did want to get out in the bush and identify the things that you're finding, it's good to have a field guide that shows you how to do that. Um, so I've got my contact details there if you want to get in touch and feel free to drop some questions in the Q&A as well for any of the talks tonight. Thanks for listening. Well, thank you very much, uh, Heidi. That's fantastic. It's a, it's an odyssey, an odyssey that's taken you all around Australia and to many other places. And I'm sure, I'm sure you're going to assist greatly all those that you teach to get a better understanding of the world. And God knows we need that. We had the climate. Uh, report coming out just this week where I'm pleased to say that at the age of 76, I won't have to look after half of the problems that my generation created, uh, but that's a selfish view. You younger ones are going to have to somehow make it work. And I think with leaders such as uh, Todd and, uh, and Heidi, and Kiara, we can go forward. Marie, I'll put you with my lot, I think. Okay. But having said that, I'd like now to go back to Marie. Marie, could we uh, give you centre stage? And um, if you have some slides you'd like to share with us, I'm, we would love to see them. Over to Marie. Thanks. Okay. Give this a go. See if it works. And well done. Now just go to your uh, slideshow. Uh, I think you're in my way there. Um, I'll get rid of that. Uh, that video that? thing up the top there. Yeah. Oh, I've tried another way. Oh, no. Right down <laughs> the bottom somewhere. Can you get it down the bottom? No. Yeah. Across the top after I'm in the sure. middle says slideshow. Yeah. No. We've got Newcastle Uni Natural History Your Illustration. Uh, something's happened here. Uh, Kiara, what are your thoughts on this? Murray, uh, would you mind uh, pressing the escape button once for me? My internet connection is unstable, it says. Yep, that's all right. Um, when it does become stable, uh, tap your escape button on your keyboard and then, yep, she's got it. All good. You got it? Okay. Yeah. Can't remember where I was up to, but I think it might have been in the end of my first year as a natural history student, um, a lecturer called Anne Llewellyn suggested I apply for a scholarship, which was worth $2,000. Um, they had been bequeathed a body of artwork by a, an artist called Margaret Senior. And if you've ever been to the national parks at all, um, they'll have posters of animals and reptiles and birds and in the bottom right-hand corner, you will see that the artist was Margaret Senior. 
So I had to um, set up a database and organise all this material. And it was really interesting because it showed her process from photographs to her field drawings to the finished artwork. Um, when I did that in the second year of that degree, I was doing a, a subject called scientific illustration. And the lecturer said, if you wanted to learn more about um, plants, go out to the Hunter Regional Botanic Gardens and volunteer in their herbarium. So I did that. And because I already had a library degree, the librarian decided that I should work there for a little bit as well. And in the meantime, uh, the curator, Harry, Harry Jones, had been to see Tom May in uh, Melbourne about starting up a fungi collection. And Pat Sheaston, who was working in the herbarium for a while there, uh, went to conferences and talked to Pina, can't think of a last name off the top of my head, the curator of Melbourne, um, the Victorian herbarium, um, to get information about how to start this collection. And before they could start the collection, they had to get permission from the board. And I heard Harry say to Pat a few times, have you written that proposal yet? And she said, no, no, not yet. And one day I said to her, would you like some help with that proposal? And she said, yes. So we sat down, we wrote it, and we took it down to Jan Noble, who was the CEO at the time, and that was the end of that. At the end of that year, I was doing a similar, the same subject that Heidi had done, um, a natural flora with um, Anita Chalmers. And Anita told the class that there was an internship down at the Australian National Herbarium. Um, and it was, goes for seven weeks, and um, if we were interested, we could apply. And I wasn't sure whether she was just talking to the science students or whether I was included. So I went up and asked um, Anita about this and she said, oh yes, they take illustrators. So she signed my bit of paper and um, I got accepted. And it wasn't until I got down there um, in Canberra that I realised that they had people from all over Australia apply for this. And um, they only took about a dozen people. So I felt really privileged to be um, accepted into that internship. And while I was down there, Jan Noble from the gardens rang me and said, Marie, they've uh, accepted the proposal, the fungi proposal. And I said, oh, that's nice, Jan. I'm, I'm glad and thanks for ringing. And she said, start collecting. And I said, but I only wrote the proposal. I don't know anything about fungi. And she said, well, you're in the right place to learn, aren't you? And I thought, well, I can't really argue with that. So when I was over in the Cryptogam Herbarium, I met Judith Kerno and Ina Lepp, and um, they were very, very uh, interesting people, and they were very generous with their information. So when I came back home, Pat and I got together, and we had to work out how we were going to start this collection. Um, we needed funding, we needed resources, and it would be housed in with the plant collection. Now, the, the plant um, collection was in a special room <coughs> that was uh, temperature controlled and insect monitored, and they were very protective about what went in and out of that herbarium. And eventually we got it all together and we started collecting within the gardens. And um, in that first year, Pat uh, discovered she had an allergy to amanitas. So she went back to the uh, plant collection and I continued um, collecting. Well, in that first year, I had lots and lots of failures because I had um, trouble identifying uh, fungi that were insect infested, especially the beliefs. And um, drying, were they dried enough? Were they, you know? And I had some collections that went mouldy because I didn't dry enough and others that I dried too much and they became very brittle. Excuse me, Marie, do you have any more, any more slides? I do. Ah. So in amongst all this, um, I was doing honours and a PhD and it was based on fungi and illustration. With the collection down at the gardens, uh, once we had mastered the curation and the collections, we needed to be able to identify them. And the biggest problem was we didn't have the skills. So we ended up going to fungi conferences and going on forays 
and some of the forays we went on with Jim um, Trappy and I think Todd might have been there when I found the orchid. And, um, you know, some of these conferences were in New Zealand and in Western Australia and, and they were very uh, interesting because you were traipsing along behind mycologists from all around the world and, and in Australia. And these people were very generous with their information. They, you know, they were just a, a wonderful group to be with. And like um, Heidi, I am still um, traipsing around with all these people. So my, really what I want to say to you is if you are interested in science, follow your dream. If it's your dream to do a science degree or, or join a citizen science group or a Facebook page, there are people in this community who are willing to help you. Don't worry about any knockbacks. Knockbacks just means that you haven't given the right information or you need to do a bit more research. And people who say that you can't do something or um, try and undermine you, well, forget about them. Find like-minded people. Look for opportunities and be open to opportunities. I didn't have any skills in fungi. I'm still struggling with the microscopy of fungi, but skills will come. It's just a matter of persevering and practicing. And my advice to you is just go for it. And I'd like to thank you for listening. And I hope that I've encouraged someone to follow the world of fungi. Thank you, Tim. Thanks very much, Marie. That is uh, fantastic. It is. Uh... It is just what I wanted when I put this set of seminars together that I wanted to have different people with different uh, paths and different viewpoints. I think uh, the take home message though in all of that is that we're all inspired by somebody who's trodden the path before us in one way or another. We're all helped by people who mentor us, who spend time with us, who, who just let us go forward uh, and, and partner us in what we're doing. And so um, my thanks to all of the speakers uh, tonight for sharing their time and their experiences with us. What I'd like to do now is to, we're at 7.53, we can go on for another 20 minutes if, uh, if we wish. So let's have a look at the chats, at, at the question and answers. I have them up there now, um, but I saw that Kiara had done something in the question and answers. So, Perhaps, uh, perhaps I could start off and then Kiara, you could come in. Lottie asked right at the start, what, what are you trying to teach us through this process? And really what I'm trying to teach you is that, that there's a whole world of science out there that can lead to a fascinating life. In my case, I've been around since uh, 1967 doing science in one way or another. As my dad used to say, when I'd go back to the small village I grew up in, in the farming country, uh, my son's back from university and we'd be walking down the street and some of the farmers would say to me, Tim, have you got a real job yet? Because I'd never really left the university, but in fact, for me, that's been just a fantastic voyage that still goes on um, next year. If we can, we'll be back in Borneo. Next year, we'll be back in Kenya as well. We're starting uh, our own biotechnology company and trying to learn to be marketers. So all those things are happening. So Lynn, I'm, uh, that, that question, it's gone now. I don't know where it went. That question is, that's what I think we're trying to teach. So Kiara, where are we on the next questions? So uh, this was asked during uh, Todd's presentation, but it might be open to all. Lynn has asked, do you know if First Nations people harvested and ate truffles or mushrooms? Yes, they did. Um, and some of them still do. Um, there's a lot of desert truffles that are still harvested out in the middle of Australia. 
Um, unfortunately, a lot of the knowledge around edible mushrooms in the eastern part of the continent um, was lost with colonization. Um, but there definitely were some that were eaten on the east coast as well. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that the edible truffles in Australia were more of a bulk food rather than um, the flavoring that you put on. So it's not like the European idea of truffle consumption. These were like meat and potatoes kind of a, f a food that you would eat as a part of your diet. Did I answer Thanks, the question, sir. I hope? Thanks very much, Todd. Perhaps um, uh, you were talking about um, marsupials in Australia spreading the truffles and therefore the fungal spores. I understand in New Zealand, the truffles are spread differently by, is it by birds? Um, that is our understanding is that birds spread truffles in New Zealand, um, but there's still not enough research to confirm that for certain, um, but possibly all the way back to moas, um, as well as current birds there may eat and disperse them. Um, New Zealand has some of the most colorful truffles in the world, so they were likely um, adapted for birds, which tend to be better at finding things visually rather than digging them up in the soil by smell like mammals. Okay, thank you. Over to Kiara again. Hi, and I apologize if I pronounce any of these names incorrectly. Uh, Tiana has asked, what is the viability of truffle spores found in dingo scat? Ah, that's a great question. Um, well, the thing is, basically from our work, we can find no indication that the, tr the truffle spores are actually degraded by the enzymes in a dingo's stomach. Um, and there's been all about 50 different animals studied to look at the viability and none of them have actually shown to stop viability. Some of them actually increase viability, just like some seeds depend on animals to scarify them. And when they pass through the gut, it actually may help with germination rates. But we're still in the process of trying to figure that out for certain with dingoes. Thanks very much, Kiara. I'd like to pop in and uh, just ask this one from an anonymous attendee. What are the ways you can find mentors? Is it only through study? Um, Heidi, would you like to have a go at that? Yeah, so something that I've learned through my experience is that definitely through study, you can find a mentor. However, it's also through just getting out there and doing what you enjoy and you'll meet other people who also enjoy doing that thing and it's all part of networking so I actually met Pam when I was young like still I don't even know if it was primary school or high school and it was just on a bushwalk it was the fungi foray and I just kind of followed Pam the whole walk started from there she hasn't been able to get rid of me yet but also like uh, Jim Trappy, Roy Halling, Michael Priest and John Bailey down in Orange as well. It's just getting out there and finding the people that are doing the thing that you want to be doing and just networking with them. And that might be through study or it might be through joining like mycological societies or bushwalking groups or anything like that, just to start to meet people really. That through my experience. And you can always reach out to people as well. Would any other panelists like to answer that question as well? How did you find a mentor? I agree with Heidi. Um, that's how I was able to get the information that I required through joining Queensland Mycological Society and Sydney Mycological Society and Fungi Map. Um, it's just a matter of going on your first fungi conference or walk, and then you'll, you'll uh, meet up with people. Okay, Kiara, back to you. Thank you. I have a question for Marie uh, from Christine. Would Marie speak to, on her knowledge of fungi, tinea and treatments? Would you say that again, please? Uh, would you like to speak on your knowledge of fungi, tinea and treatments? Uh, <laughs> I've probably forgotten all that now because it's been over 20 years since I nursed. <laughs> no, I'm not a problem. Wouldn't. 
Um, I, think, I, I think if I could just jump in there and uh, Todd and Heidi might jump in as well. Um, the fungi are the great decomposers. That they decompose everything and they can decompose us so they can infect us. But fungi also have to survive in an environment where other things attack them, bacteria attack them and so on. So fungi develop a whole lot of toxins which uh, they can use to stop bacteria attacking them. And indeed that's how we got uh, penicillin, penicillin being an antibiotic, a, a substance able to kill bacteria. Now the fungi that uh, Todd is talking about, those fungi are fungi that are actually mining minerals from rocks and bringing those, those metals to the plant. And the plant then is giving uh, sugars back to the fungus in the roots. And so there's a symbiosis. But the tinea under your toenail is a fungus that's living there quite happily. And it's very difficult to get rid of because the, the fungi are uh, able to modulate our immune system to stop our immune system from attacking them. So uh, the fungi ecosystem across all aspects is, I think, one of the most fascinating. Indeed, it's thought that uh, fungi are responsible for stopping coal being laid down because when uh, fungi developed the enzymes to break down the lignin of woods, then uh, from that period on, uh, we didn't get the deposition of coal. All sorts of things with fungi, fascinating fungi. Kiara, you're next, please. Uh, I have a question doubled up from Ichi Kuya and David Barnes. Um, are any of the truffles poisonous? And if so, how do birds and mammals differentiate? Um, uh, great question. I think the, it's probably the, the simplest way to say it is that what we perceive as toxins um, are not necessarily toxic for all other organisms. Um, so for example, squirrels can eat amylene phylloides, which is one of the most deadly to humans um, mushrooms in the world. Um, so their perceptions of toxins, um, particularly for non-human mammals, um, is really complicated. So some of the research on primate consumption of fungi, uh, some of the macaques, for example, they have very similar tastes to some humans as far as what they will eat and what they consider toxic. Whereas squirrels and animals that are more distantly related to humans, their abilities to process toxins are totally different than humans. Um, and for the most part, truffles are pretty benign because when you grow underground, the number one thing you want to have happen to you is to get eaten because you can't get your dis spores dispersed into the air. So for the most part, that group is toxic. The toxicity is very, very low or non-existent. But I can't say it across the board because more than half of the truffles in the world are still undescribed. So we don't know very much about most of them. But the current state is that they're probably mostly edible and we can assume that it's safe for humans and also safe for most animals. I hope that answers the question. Thank Anybody you. else like to jump in and answer that question as well? Where am I? Kiara? I think Todd covered it pretty well. Yes. <laughs> Um, I have a question from seven-year-old Ethan, and he would like to know everyone's favorite fungi. For me, it's Todd, what's your favorite fungi? Oh. Heidi, you're next, but you're muted now. Oh, I'm still thinking. I don't know. <laughs> There's too many to choose from. <laughs> I'm always, I'm always really happy to see a blue one or a purple one or a green one or I like the colourful ones and I'm always excited to dig up a truffle as well or any of like the puffballs or the, the goopy ones that kind of explode a little bit, they're good as well. <laughs> it's too many. Marie? 
Um, I don't really have a favourite either because um, they're just such a wonderful organism and the colours and, you know, even cutting up a truffle or a puffball, there's so many shapes and um, colours amongst them. They're just, they're just beautiful. So I don't really have a favourite. I do probably lean towards the smelly ones, the um, acero rubras and because of the colours and, and they're usually the ones that people kick and don't want to know about because they are smelly. So I probably um, lean towards those more than anything. Okay. Okay. Um, can I ask two questions now of Todd, please? And one from Malaysia um, says, I can see that Todd used to go to Thailand from some research. I am from Malaysia, a country next to Thailand. So may I know what kind of fungi, Todd, did you find in Thailand? Oh, I found so many amazing fungi in Thailand. Um, there's so much incredible diversity all through um, Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, I was particularly fascinated with the insect pathogens, the ones that are killing insects and come sprouting out of their heads. Um, I also found some very interesting truffles there, as well as all sorts of other groups as well. Thank you, Todd. Now, the next one is Mindy from California. My question is for Todd. Regarding the fungi that form tree cavities, are there any that are species specific? Could there be an increase in tree cavities and potential cavity nesting sites that result from the wide popularity and planting of eucalyptus trees outside of Australia? Um, good question. Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand what um, they're asking, but my, my understanding is that there are some fungi that are very specific to trees, certain tree species, um, but it depends also where the tree is. So just because there's a eucalyptus in California doesn't mean that the same fungus that is a cavity creator in Australia um, has also been introduced. Um, but in, in North America, there's many, many uh, fungi that are involved in creating cavities, but usually they also associate with woodpeckers. So the woodpeckers are able to tell that there's decomposition happening in the middle of the tree. And then they come along, they start to bore a hole in and woodpeckers, if they can avoid it, they have the abilities to bore through all sorts of things. But if they can avoid it, they're much happier to go into a tree that has a rotten core um, because it's easier. So I, I hope I answered the question, but if, if please feel free to ask a follow up if I didn't if I didn't get everything that you were. Hoping okay, and I think that uh, that goes for all our speakers. They would be more than happy to be contacted by you uh, to follow up with emails. Uh, what we are uh, talking about tonight. Indeed, there are many, many questions here. Kiara, you had one that you would, wanted to answer. And that was from uh, Terence, Terence Annabel. Terence Annabel. I found a white elkhorn shaped fungus with gray tips. How do I get it identified? And I see Kiara would like to answer that question. <laughs> Sorry, I just indicated that it was a great question. Heidi, would you like to potentially give this one a go? How do you identify what it is? Great question. <laughs> Um, there's a few few ways to identify fungi. You can either try to do it yourself or you can try and get someone else to identify it for you. Now, I always encourage people to have a go at it themselves and then ask other people. So that, that's what I was always encouraged to do anyway, especially by Michael Priest. He's like, oh, have a go at identifying it yourself so you learn and then you can check if it's right or if it's wrong. And then you can learn through that process, which I was, yeah, he's right. It's a really great thing to do. But if you're just looking for an ID, um, you can contact uh, mycologists at herbariums generally, particularly at Orange, the GPI there, John Bailey and Michael Priest are there. And through their website, they can offer IDs. However, there's probably easier ways to do it if you're on Facebook. Um, not necessarily completely reliable, but there's some really great Facebook groups out there 
um, for fungi and particularly like the mycological society groups they have a lot of really knowledgeable people in there and you can usually get an id pretty quickly and there'll be people willing to explain to you how to id it as well um, so that could be a good way to do it otherwise you can go and trawl through the the research and the publications and the books if you've got field guides or anything like that that can lead to an id as well um, but yeah generally if you're not sure you can try and find someone to ask them and they usually most people i've come across are really willing to help out not sure if anyone else has something to add to that well i could definitely link into dave has asked a question um Heidi, do you have a website where you have identified the fungi in your slides? Um, so I don't have a website. I do put a lot of my photos up on Flickr and a few on Instagram as well. And if I've put them up, I've generally put them up with an ID. Um, there are some other websites out there where people have put their photos up with identification as well. I know Todd's got a good um social media presence and his websites and things like that as well have ID IDs on them. I hope that helps. <laughs> um, what about iNaturals? Yeah, yep. that's another one. Okay, say that again slowly, please. iNaturals. I think there was a question about that too. Is that oh, an, is is that an app it. or is that a, a website? It's a website, but there is an app connected to it and you can take a photo and upload it to the website. It's with the, is it with the Australian, oh, Heidi, I need your help here. Um, what's it called? Oh, what's the, with the iNaturalist is connected to? Oh, the Atlas. Atlas, that's yeah, it. Yeah, Atlas of Living yes. Australia. Yeah, that's it, yep. yeah. Okay. And, um, so another popular website is called Mushroom Observer. Oh, yes. Roy's. Yeah, that's a good one. Yes. Okay, that was Mushroom Observer. Uh, Kiara, I want to jump in and ask a question uh, because I've been fascinated to be able to go up to the Hunter Region Botanic Gardens at night and see the ghost mushrooms. And I'd like uh, Marie and Heidi and Todd to talk about that because Shani at 08, at eight, whoops, Shani disappeared. Um, what happened to Shani? Shani asked a question and she said, um, I've lost Shani's question, why? Anyway, Shani said, uh, It says on the East Coast, are there phosphorescent mushrooms? On the East Coast, are there phosphorescent mushrooms? Could you three just tell us a little bit about that? No more than half a minute each. Go. Who's first? Righto, it's Marie, you're first. <laughs> well, it depends on what you want to know about them. Um, my knowledge is probably limited, but um, Omphalotus nidiformis, it's called, or ghost fungi, and it occurs along the East Coast. And I can say that um, once a year or uh, around May, the Hunter Regional Botanic Gardens has night walks where you can um, come along and we'll tell you all about this fungus and show you the habitat that it's living in. Um, it looks pretty ordinary during the day, but uh, I believe that it has luciferins that cause it to glow at night time. Um, I know during the day there's, it's got a lot of insects around it, um, but it's when you take a photo of it, it turns out ir ir iridescent green, but during the day, it's just a plain little old white thing. And it lives on um, dead logs usually, although I have seen it growing on a living uh, banks here as well. Thank you. Uh, anyone else wants to talk about that? Todd or Heidi? Um. I can add that uh, I've I've seen a few different glowing mushrooms in my different work in different places, and by far the ghost fungus is the most amazing for intensity and brilliance um, for how well it glows. So I highly recommend if you get the chance to see it. You could practically make words out on a page if it's a bright one, um, and it's 
absolutely phenomenal. There's also some amazing ones that'll get in and make the leaf litter. Um, on a wet night, you can sometimes find sections of the forest floor that glow. Um, and that's actually the mycelium in the leaf litter that's causing it to glow. And the same thing, sometimes rotting stumps will decompose and glow. Um, and then there's a few other sort of small, not as exciting as the, the ghost fungus that glow as well. And you got to look a little harder for them. But if you can see the ghost fungus, I highly recommend it. Okay, that's it, Heidi. Any comments? Uh, just to add that if you're in the Newcastle area, you can definitely go and see it. Um, the the Botanic Gardens up in the Wadigans, you can find it, and you can even find it at, like in Newcastle, so kind of like Blackbutt Reserve, Richley's Reserve, I've seen it there. So it's around, so keep an eye out. And Barrington Tops is another place I've seen it. Fabulous, thank you. Kiara, over to you. Uh, we have an awesome question from eight-year-old Eli, who would like to know, what is the most poisonous fungi you've found? That glowing one's poisonous, pretty sure. That's what comes to mind for me. Um, the, the first time I picked it, we found it in the Wadigans and I, I brought one home because we couldn't stay till dark. So there was one kind of fallen off the log and I brought it home and it was in a cup in the car and my mum was freaking out because she thought we were all going to die from this poisonous mushroom. We didn't. <laughs> and it did glow. Yes, Todd? I, I think that's, that's, that's definitely a highlight for seeing a poisonous mushroom is the one that glows. Now, that one won't really kill you. It'll make you really sick and really vomity. Um, but there are a few that will, will kill you. Um, and those are generally, a lot of people have a fear of, of these poisonous mushrooms. But for the most part, looking at them and handling them, it's, you're, it's safe. It's really actually eating them that you have to worry about. Um, and if you're careful and learn to identify them accurately, it's not that dangerous to learn to handle and identify mushrooms. And so it shouldn't be something that you're afraid of per se. That's all, I just wanna stress that point because a lot of people are always, ah, they're all gonna kill me. It's not really like that. How what? dangerous do you have to consider the spores? <laughs> Sorry, um, how dangerous with the spores from a fungi like that where it's dangerous to eat? but if you're collecting it or ruffling up the soil nearby, how dangerous would the spores be? The, the spores aren't, aren't dangerous unless you inhale them in large, large quantities. So there's one case where some kids on the street were sold a um, puffball as a psychedelic mushroom and they tried snorting it and the spores actually germinated in their lungs and the doctors thought they had some sort of pneumonia um, but it turned out it was actually just the fungus growing into their lungs and they gave them a strong antifungal and it, it killed it. Um, but for the most part, unless you have a, a rare reaction to sort of a contact dermatitis or something like that, they're, they're very safe to handle and touch and look at. Um, there's very, very few exceptions to that rule. There was a case in New Zealand where a lady had inhaled the spores of Shazophyllum commune, which is a, a bracket fungus that grows on dead wood. And she ended up with it growing in her lungs as well. And same case, it made her really, really sick. They didn't know what was going on. And once they worked it out, like some pretty strong antifungals and she came good again. So it happens, but very, very rarely. It's gotta be pretty specific conditions for that to happen. Yeah, it's, it's most common among people that work in really large scale fungus farms in Asia that are indoors and they're not wearing proper um, masks because they actually just are in inhaling such a quantity of spores, but any sort of environment with that much fine particulate is dangerous for the lungs. Perhaps I could uh, come in with an answer to Tori Thew's question. Tori has asked, how do you know where a truffle is? Are there above ground indicators? And certainly after I had been on my first uh, truffle foray with uh, uh, with Todd and uh, we were down south and we were finding fossils of truffles. I was thinking, this is fantastic. And in reading a little bit about it, uh, it's all to do with smell in terms of the above ground indicators. That's my answer. Uh, and, and I think that's why, for instance, when we want to trap 
Australian marsupials. We want to trap bandicoots. We want to trap possums and so on. Uh, when we want to trap these small marsupials, we put some peanut butter in the trap. And I think that's because some of the smells that come from the truffles are like peanut butter, they like bitumen, they, they are peculiar smells. And according to the truffles, if you walk through the Australian bush at the right time, some of the smells you smell are actually uh, smells coming from a ripe truffle underground, and they would be a signal to an animal to dig and eat it. That's the extent of my knowledge. Uh, Marie, Todd and Heidi, could you have a go at that? Above ground indicators for truffles? I found some recently up in our property in the Barringtons, and I didn't have to dig at all. They were just kind of sitting on the ground. Um, so I don't know if they'd grown under the leaf litter and the leaf litter had blown away, or if they'd just been so near the surface that they were on the surface. And um, that was kind of like in really short, mossy, grassy area. And they were just literally all over the ground. They kind of looked like truffles, but they weren't, they were truffles. And the other, other Did time- Did they I have found, a smell? Yeah, like a mushroomy smell, mm -hmm. a little bit like dirt. Um, and then the other time, the same place, I found them without digging and they were, they'd grown under the ground, but they had actually pushed up the soil above. So there were little mounds in the soil with a little crack in the top. And I just kind of wondered what it was and scraped away at it. And there was truffle under there. And I looked around, found about 20 of them in a metre square without having to go searching really. So that was kind of cool. Um, Apart from that, maybe just looking where the little animals have dug and left anything behind. That's my experience. Hmm. Todd? Um, for, for me, I, I would add on to what Heidi said about looking for where animals have dug. That's the most reliable um, technique that I've found. Um, after you've hunted truffles enough, you can sort of tell where in the forest they might be growing. Um, for the most part, humans generally have pretty unimpressive uh, sense of smell abilities, um, particularly compared to the animals that are the normal dispersers. So it's pretty unusual for us to be able to pick up the smell and at least necessarily know that's what we're smelling. Um, there are a few cases of people who are blind and as a sort of coping mechanism tend to have a better sense of smell in some cases and they can actually target and find some of the European um, valuable truffles based on smell. Um, but that's just because they've honed their senses of smell so much better than the rest of us. Um, but for the most part, it's basically looking at sort of environmental signs. And keep in mind that a truffle is sort of like saying a shrub. So there's an incredible variability in what that is. Um, at what point does a shrub become a tree? It's, you can debate it all day. And the same thing for truffles. Some of them are deep under the ground and some of them sit right at the surface and some of them look like mushrooms that never really open. Um, and so all along that sort of that spectrum, there's different levels of sense of smell. And some of the species that fruit deep have much stronger smells. And there's some groups that after fires actually smell like rotting onions and the wallabies go crazy for them and they'll start digging them up because they smell so much stronger. And those humans could probably pick up because the smells can be so potent, but you'll be lucky to beat a wallaby to them. Usually you'll just find the skins they've left behind. So that's my take on it. Thanks very much for that. Um, uh, Christine Engel asked a question, how do, bush, how do bushfires affect fungi? And I guess um, the hot fires would be dangerous, Todd, uh, but the, the cool burns would not be so dangerous. But uh, any comments about bushfires and fungi? Um, I would just add on to say that you can't make one rule across the board for fungi. So some fungi are going to really regret the fire and do really poorly. And some of them depend on a fire. Um, so it again comes down to the species you're talking about. Some of them only grow on charred wood or are come out of soil after they've been exposed to heat. So it's really variable. Um, so I, I would say that, yeah, it just depends on the species you're specifically talking about. But there are some that really suffer and some that love it and everything in between. Okay, um, well, 
I'm going to draw the questions to a close. We've still got a whole host of questions which we won't get through, but I'm uh, keen to finish by 8.30. So I'd ask Kiara if she could put up one of my slides, please. I can't recall which slide I've got, but let's go here. Yes, uh, so if I click that, I might be able to see something. Um, yeah, what I wanted to do, you 79 people who are still left, is to thank you for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed this event. I've, I've had a fascinating time tonight listening to people talk from the heart, uh, listening to people who are coping with COVID in all sorts of different ways and people who are positive for the future. As you can see from the slide uh, that I'm sharing with you, this is one of our My Science Odyssey journeys that uh, we're going to present. There are five, uh, four more coming, and I hope indeed that you would be able to join us next Saturday night for our second My Science Odyssey seminar. The uh, wonderful Kiara Harrison is going to be talking about, about her research into male infertility. Uh, Harry Callan will be talking about what it's like to do environmental engineering and then get out into the real world and use satellites to model floods. And Willow Forsyth, who was an international banker, will be telling us about her PhD research that she's doing uh, on awareness of floods. What are the indicators that will make people have a good flood plan and why don't some people have a good flood plan? All of that, of course, is vital in terms of us having a climate change plan as well. And we need one of those. So. I hope you can join us for our next seminar next Saturday. Uh, and I don't think I've got any more slides than that. So it's just, uh, again, to thank everybody for coming. I, I really am so pleased that Todd and Heidi and Marie put their effort into getting a presentation together. And I thank you Kiara for keeping me sane. And with that, I'm going to close the meeting. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye. Thanks, Tim.